We're moving into second gear on Game Boy Works Guide in episode 10. Yo, I'll solve it. Moving beyond the Game Gear's debut and into its post-launch releases, we can see a clear pattern taking shape with these games. If the Day One titles were all about mass appeal and engaging the enthusiasm of as many people as possible, what followed were games for the adults in the room. Again, Sega had a clear example of what worked and what didn't work in the portable gaming space thanks to a year and a half of Nintendo's Game Boy. A huge part of Nintendo's success had come in marketing Game Boy not only to the kids who were salivating over the next Mario game, but also to the grown-ups who needed a quick-hit time waster during their commute. Sega wasted no time in diversifying the Game Gear's roster to embrace that audience. The first few dozen Game Boy cartridges contained a handful of concepts geared toward the OG-sans in the audience. Yakuman, Golf, and of course, Tetris. Whereas Sega hit that demographic hard from the outset, embracing the tendency for the company's fanbase to skew older than Nintendo's to begin with. These Game Gear releases did hold something in common with Game Boy's games though. This more buttoned-down corner of the software rack was strictly geared toward the Japanese audience. The Western market was still treated by Japanese devs with a certain diffidence, or maybe disinterest would be a better term, with early localized titles strictly centering on all-ages releases that needed little localization to begin with. Certainly, the Japan-only Game Gear debut from developer Wolf Team does not fall into the category of games requiring little localization. A historic strategy title, Zon Gear, is loaded with dense, adult-level kanji, the intricate ideogrammatic writing system Japan adopted from the Chinese. Zon Gear is one of those import titles that my sub-kindergarten Japanese literacy capabilities immediately bounce off of. An ocean of symbols and menus with basic functions hidden behind a wall of cultural heritage to which your average guy Kokujin isn't really privy. Which isn't to say it's completely impenetrable, the way, say, an entirely text-based horse racing gambling simulation is. After all, this is a strategy game, and in the broad strokes it bears a fair resemblance to the likes of Koei's Nobunaga's Ambition and Intelligent Systems Famicom Wars, aka Game Boy Wars or Advance Wars. You move units around a map, limited to a set range per move, based on the capabilities of your army in the surrounding terrain, laying siege to cities, and mixing it up with enemy legions. Mechanically, it has far more in common with Intelligent Systems Wars series than with Koei's Sims. There are no sophisticated trade and resource management systems in place here that I can determine. You don't need to worry about assigning lieutenants for your daimyo, or allocating sufficient crops to feed your citizenry. The biggest resemblance to Nobunaga's ambition comes in the fact that Zangir takes place in the Sengoku era of Japanese history, as the conflict revolves around multiple warring alliances. It's one of those games whose premise is contained in the title. To Anglophones, Zangir may sound like it should be some sort of cool action game about futuristic mecha or something, but to those fluent in Japanese, Zan is an archaic term for beheading. So the presence of its uncommon kanji in the title immediately speaks to the fact that this is a period piece about martial conflict. As for the gear part, that just means it's the Game Gear iteration of the series. This is a portable adaptation of a computer game originally published for the Sharp X68000 home computer. Naturally, it's a simpler take on the material than its PC predecessor had been. Zangir gives players control of a blue army that holds a handful of feudal Japan's autonomous states and is badly outnumbered by the rival Red Army. A third faction, the Green Neutral Territories, can evidently be talked on a state-by-state -state basis into joining your side. However, they can just as easily turn on you and join the Red Team. Conflicts play out as little representational dramas, like in Advance Wars, with a strength of muster for each army's regiments of soldiers and cavalry depicted as individual units that automatically clash and blink into non-existence when overpowered. As sim games go, it seems fine from what I've played and can understand, and for Japanese strategy wonks who wanted a portable fix in 1990, it was probably a pretty compelling idea, since the only real alternative at the time was the fussier and more compromised Nobunaga's ambition for Game Boy. In terms of design, this is a bit of an outlier for Wolf Team, who made their name among Sega fans as the studio behind action hits like Valis, Arcus, and Granada. It's also an outlier in terms of tech. This would be Wolf Team's only creation for Game Gear, as the company ultimately would stick to Genesis and Sega CD before splintering into factions while creating the Tales series for Namco. On the other hand, Tyson Mahjong Haopai comes to us from developer Arc System Works, a studio that would be fairly prolific on Game Gear. Although best known these days for the Guilty Gear series, Arc System Works at the time did a lot of contract and conversion work for a variety of publishers. 
including Rolling Thunder for NES, Battletoads for Genesis, and Game Gear's version of Pengo from last episode. In other words, they're good eggs, and Tyson Mahjong Haupai is perfectly fine. It's another Mahjong game based on the usual Japanese Ryichi rule set. I feel like I'm slowly learning more of how this genre works as I cover the games. There seems to be some sort of unwritten rule that every Japanese console needs one near launch, but I admit I'm still a little fuzzy on precise nuances. I will say that compared to Yakuman on Game Boy, Tyson Mahjong Haupai offers a fairly convincing presentation. Obviously, it benefits from the addition of color, which doesn't simply make it more attractive, but also makes the individual tiles more legible at a glance. It also gives players a choice of six different playable avatars, ranging from a salaryman and office lady to a shifty looking guy who's clearly meant to be Yakuza. I have to assume these represent a de facto difficulty level, since the office lady appears in the upper left corner while the Chinese style old man appears in the bottom right, which based on gender and ethnic stereotypes suggests a gradation from easy to difficult. Gameplay works as you'd expect and exactly as it does in every other Mahjong game. Arc System Works wasn't reinventing the wheel here, just delivering a straightforward take on a traditional tabletop pastime. You take a handful of tiles, attempt to create sets, call plays before you complete them, and earn points for your performance at the end. All in all, a respectable rendition of the tabletop pursuit, and by far the best looking one on the portable market as of November 1990. And finally, the one game this episode that should appeal to everyone, not just the geezers in the room. Revenge of Drancon. Although it's hard to know exactly, based on the box art and the marketing around this game, who exactly it was meant to appeal to. Well, this box art and title hint at some sort of apocalyptic tale featuring a monstrous Zardoz-style disembodied head raining destruction upon the earth. In fact, Revenge of Drancon is Wonder Boy. Not a Wonder Boy sequel or spin-off or reinterpretation, it literally is just a portable adaptation of the Master System version of the game presented lovingly on Game Gear. I can't begin to guess why Sega of America wouldn't just call it Wonder Boy the way it was in Europe and Japan, but I have to assume that the upbeat, colorful vibe given off by the series just didn't fit the hard edge style Sega had begun to adopt in the US. It's a weird choice though. Nintendo sold tens of millions of copies of Super Mario Land for Game Boy, and while Wonder Boy didn't have Mario's cachet, at least not outside of Brazil or select parts of Europe, Revenge of Drancon achieves something Super Mario Land didn't even come close to doing. Namely, it's a highly faithful rendition of the original console game, where Super Mario Land was a sort of scaled down and highly truncated take on the Mario genre created by a team that had only worked on Mario, but not Super Mario titles. This is 100% identical to the Master System port of Wonder Boy in all but visual resolution. After all, the Game Gear was a portable Master System that traded screen pixel resolution for greater color depth, meaning this truly was a case of Sega doing what Nintendo didn't and couldn't. It should have been the easiest sales pitch in the world. Remember Wonder Boy? Here it is. No tiny sprites, no weird physics, no barely recognizable variants on familiar monsters. Oh, and by the way, Nintendo fans, you know and love this as Hudson's Adventure Island. You're not going to get this version on Game Boy, though, that's for sure. But no. Instead, America got Revenge of Drancon, Drancon, a game that, going by comments I've seen on Twitter, many hardcore game enthusiasts don't realize is actually just Wonder Boy even 30 years later. It's such a strange marketing choice. But yeah, this is Wonder Boy. I've been wondering which platform I'd be covering this game on first, since developer Westone put it on basically everything back in the day. Hudson's version, the aforementioned Adventure Island, is coming up in NES Works. That game shipped in the US in September of 1988. But this is Wonder Boy, the original, or at least a strong interpretation of it. Produced as the debut title by Westone, a company that had previously gone under the fairly generic name Escape, Wonder Boy was a pretty decent arcade hit for Sega. We've already seen Westone on NES Works as they were the studio that belted out the better than it ought to have been Jaws for LJN in the space of a month, but Wonder Boy, that was their baby. After its arcade debut for Sega, Wonder Boy would spawn a bizarre and confusing empire of direct sequels, licensed splinter titles, remakes, and spiritual successors. The original game, however, was basically just a blend of Super Mario Bros. and Pac-Land. The Super Mario influences are fairly on the nose. Wonder Boy, or Tom Tom if you're nasty, runs and jumps through 32 stages, which are divided into 8 worlds of 4 levels apiece. One hit by an enemy kills Tom Tom, but you can absorb a hit by collecting the proper power-up, in this case a terribly anachronistic skateboard. Tom Tom can also pick up a projectile, in this case a stone axe, and he'll frequently stumble across power-ups that warp him to a special bonus stage in the clouds. At the end of each of the eight worlds, TomTom -tom battles a largely identical boss to the other levels. 
Not unlike Bowser being a magical illusion cast over a standard monster in Super Mario Bros. Worlds 1 through 7, the villain, uniquely named Drancon in this version, appears in different guises with a common body and different faces. Tom Tom also has Mario style variable momentum. By holding the attack button, you can run faster and jump further. You can also gain additional height on your leaps by pressing up as you jump. In a lot of ways, though, Wonder Boy feels more like Namco's Pac Land than it does Super Mario Bros. This is a more linear and straightforward game than anything Mario ever appeared in, with no bricks to bash and no secret pipes to duck into. The action in Wonder Boy maintains a brisk pace, hastened along by Tom Tom's ever dwindling stamina meter. By modern gaming conventions, the fact that Tom Tom dies in a single hit but also has a stamina meter seems a bit counterintuitive, but it makes more sense if you think of the meter as a timer. Tom Tom's energy constantly ticks down, and if he allows it to drain completely, he'll lose a life. You need to complete a stage before running out of power which is more easily said than done. Each of the stages in Wonder Boy, or rather Revenge of Drancon, is quite long, consisting of four different subsections. To keep up his energy, Tom Tom needs to gather up fruit and other edible collectibles, which recharge his stamina to varying degrees. There are additional beneficial items like mushrooms and milk, which provide health perks and bad collectibles like the Shinigami that appears from speckled eggs and follows along behind Tom Tom to sap his health at several times its normal rate. There are other hazards to contend with as well. Lots of the platforms that appear throughout the world love to drop unexpectedly from beneath Tom Tom's feet, and the timing of moving platforms makes the skateboard, which turns the game into an auto-scroller, as much a danger as it is a power-up. And while enemies, flames, and monsters will kill Tom Tom at a touch, some objects, like rocks, literally just exist to trip him up. Stumble over a small rock and Tom Tom will lose his balance and a few points of stamina. This is a simpler, less intricate game than Super Mario Bros., but for a run and jump action title, Wonder Boy, I mean, Revenge of Drancon, benefits from its lack of pretense. And it really is impressive how well it works on Game Gear. Even the fact that Weststone kept the console graphics intact rather than scaling them down to Game Gear resolution doesn't have the negative impact you see in so many Game Boy titles with oversized sprites. The game moves at just the right speed, and its visuals and levels are presented cleanly enough so that you never feel like it's full of unfair gotcha moments. Or at least, there are no gotcha moments that didn't exist in the full-sized version. Even small details like the sound design factor into the overall sense of fair play. You can't always see enemies that spring out to attack from as far out as you were able to on Master System, such as the leaping octopuses, but you can hear the sound of their jumping from the same rage as in the console version, giving you a heads up that you'll see them soon. In short, it's a remarkably strong direct console to portable conversion, the likes of which we really haven't seen to date on Game Boy. On top of that, it's a conversion of a fairly major title for Sega, a franchise that by this point had appeared on all their consoles to date. Revenge of Drencon is proof positive that the Game Gear was capable of delivering a console caliber experience in a way that competition had yet to do. In fact, it would be nearly a decade before the original Super Mario Brothers would actually come to Game Boy, or rather, to Game Boy Color. In light of all that, the decision to erase Wonder Boy from the US packaging and marketing for the game seems doubly confusing, but I suppose it's proof positive that even Sega's hallowed ultra-aggro marketing style in the 90s didn't always hit the mark. In the next Game Boy Works Guide In, we'll wrap up the Game Gear's 1990 library and bring the system's chronology in line with Nintendo's handheld.